Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. I want to thank Carl for supporting the show through support.greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by just going over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Crime Photographer, the original air date, September the 5th of 1946. And the title is The Handkerchief. Crime Photographer. Oh, hello, Miss Williams. I was just telling Casey... Hello, Annie. What have you got there? Ah, oh, yes, it was... Oh, Casey, don't they look good? I just couldn't resist them. A jar of strawberry preserve. Yeah. Say, they look just like those my grandmother used to make. Uh, somebody talking about food? Well, look, Tony. Don't they look wonderful? Oh, they sure do. And in a glass jar, too. Oh, smart gal, Annie. Uh, see the anchor and the H on the bottom? This jar was made by Anchor Hawking. Anchor Hawking, a great name in glass. Crime Photographer, brought to you by Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor glass containers, anchor caps and closures. All products of Anchor Hawking, a great name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, The Handkerchief. Joe Poletti's tavern in the factory district at 11.30 o'clock on a Friday night is almost deserted. Behind the long bar, two white-coated bartenders are busily polishing glasses, while Joe Poletti himself, the jovial-looking fat man, checks his cash register. The street door opens, and a huge uniformed policeman enters. Evening, Joe. Ah, Lieutenant McHugh. Hi, Mac. Hello, Lieutenant. Bill, Landy. Say, where's your other barkeep tonight, Joe? Gus? Oh, he was not feeling so good. I told him to go home and lie down. But he'll be back on a job at 12 o'clock when the rush starts. This is the night of your big rush, isn't it? Friday's payday at the factory. Yeah, five minutes after 12 o'clock, everyone who quits work at midnight comes in to cash his paycheck. And uh, uh, buy a drink. Or a dozen drinks. <laughs> You've got a sweet racket, Joe. Yeah, to cash these checks is good business. Uh, what do you have, Lieutenant? I'm out of cigars again. Well, here's your special brand. Thanks. Say, how much worth of checks you figure on cashing for that factory crowd tonight? Well, last week was over 16000 Tonight in my safe upstairs, I got 20000 a box. Well, that's a lot of dough. Too many people know you keep heavy cash on hand these Friday nights. That's dangerous. Oh, what's dangerous? And I got a first-class safe in my apartments upstairs. And I also got a burglar alarm. Ain't you cops I got a precinct station just one block away? If anybody tried to stick me up, ain't you going to come and stop him? <laughs> <laughs> You're a hard guy to argue with, Joe. Because he's got a thick skull, McHugh. What are you doing here, Snyder? I just dropped in for a beer. Snyder, when I pay you off two weeks ago, I told you to get out of my place and keep out. So what? Public place, isn't it? Come on, draw me a beer, Joe. I... Bill. Yeah, boss. Give this louse a beer. See, he pays for it. Okay. <laughs> Your boss don't like me, Bill. Neither do I or anybody else here. Here's your beer. Thanks. Here's your dough. 
Where are you working now, Snyder? I ain't working. Joe Paletti's seen to that. I ain't recommending no bartender I catch you stealing from my cash register. I didn't steal. If you could prove I did, you'd have turned me over to the cops. Joe could have proved it. He just gave you a break, Snyder. And you're not decent enough to appreciate it. Now finish your beer and get out of here. Okay, copper, I'll drink up and get out. <clears throat> Wind if I wipe my mouth off first? <clears throat> How do you guys like this handkerchief I'm using? Pretty classy, huh? Yeah, it's a just the like of you, Snyder. It's a loud, it's a cheap, and it's got a lot of yellow in it. Maybe someday, Joe, you'll be kind of sorry for the raw stuff you pulled on me. For so long, when I see you next, I hope it's in the... In the obituary columns. He's got a few drinks under his belt, Joe. If he comes back tonight, you better keep an eye on him. You too, Bill. He won't bother the boss, Mac. Well, I've got to get back to the station house. Uh, here's for the cigars, Joe. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, Lieutenant. Uh, yes, Joe? How's your wife? Oh, about the same. She doesn't get any better. Uh, she's been sick a long time, huh? Yeah, over a year. Cost you plenty of money, huh? Every cent I had. Look. If I can help now, anybody... thanks, Joe, but the guy in my job can't borrow dough from... Well, not to keep his nose clean. I'll see you later. So long, Mac. Good night, Lieutenant. Uh, Andy. Yes? You uh, bring up plenty of lemons? Uh, more than we need, Joe. Okay. Uh, ten minutes to twelve. I go upstairs now and get the money from my safe to catch them paychecks. <laughs> When is Gus supposed to get back here, Bill? Twelve o'clock, Andy. I uh, hope he gets here. We need help to handle that factory mob. Gus won't let us down. I wonder if we shade enough ice. Aye, uh, there's plenty. Say, what was that rat Snyder in here for? I was at the far end of the bar when you and the boss and Lieutenant McHugh were talking to him. Oh, he was just... <laughs> What's that? Gunshots. Upstairs, where the boss is. That's his burglar alarm. Come on. I'm with you. We're coming, Joe. Uh, the door is locked. We got to break it down. Let's go together. Hey, look, the safe is open. There's Joe on the floor. He's been shot through the head. Ah, uh, that back window's open. The killer busted out there. Can you see anyone? Uh, no, too dark. But the cops have heard that alarm. They'll get whoever did this. Andy, I know who did it. What? Come here. Look at that handkerchief on the floor. Handkerchief. That's the loud one Ed Snyder had tonight. Now that Labor Day has passed, it might be well to take stock and see what new equipment you need in your kitchen and dining room. Here's a suggestion. Go to your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store and make a selection of Fire King oven glass. You will find casseroles of different sizes and styles, baking dishes for meat loaves and hot breads, pie plates, mixing bowls and custard cups. In fact, there's a Fire King dish for every baking requirement. Prices are almost unbelievably low, and each piece of Fire King oven glass is guaranteed for two years against oven breakage. Fire King oven glass is sturdy and dependable in your kitchen and remarkably attractive on your table. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. All right, now, Bill, if you and Andy will take another pose in front of that door you busted open after you heard the shooting. Like this, Mr. Casey? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Hey, you get in this shot, too, Gus. Well, I, uh, I didn't get here till after poor old Joe was killed, Mr. Casey. Well, that doesn't matter. You're one of the bartenders. Stand next to Andy, huh? Okay, all right. All right, I'll face the camera now. Hold it. That does it. You got enough pictures, Casey. Now, I want these gentlemen to go on telling me what happened after they found the body. Well, we told you about all there is to tell, Miss Williams. The cops and, uh... Lieutenant McHugh here. They come running up these stairs only about a minute later. We'd heard the burglar alarm, of course. Well, how do you figure Paletti pressed that alarm button after he was shot through the head, Lieutenant? Huh? He fell on the button, Casey. It was next to the safe. Oh. But you policemen didn't catch the killer, Lieutenant. He got away through that dark alley with Joe Paletti's $20,000. Is 
that right? Yes, but he won't get far with that 20 grand, Miss Williams. That yellow handkerchief Bill found on the floor told us who he is. I've got every cop in this precinct looking for Snyder. You say he's been a bartender whom Paletti fired for theft. Yes, and an all-around rat. Mm. Uh, Lieutenant Mack, how do you figure Snyder got in here, huh? Bill says Paletti always kept that window locked. Huh? Well... Well, this Snyder guy could have come up these front steps. There's two doors at the bottom... One leading into the bar and the other under the street. Oh, uh, but Paletti wouldn't have let him in the door up here, not Snyder. Doesn't matter how he got in. Before he got out, he left evidence enough to burn him. I'd recognize that loud yellow handkerchief among a thousand others. So would I, Lieutenant. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll go up now and look things over. Come on, you fellas. Captain Logan, Casey. Hello, Logan. What? Casey. So the big boss of the homicide squad has finally gotten here. Hi, you, Captain. I might have known you two'd get around to get in my hair. Hello, McHugh. Glad to see you, Captain. Hello, Doc, Pete. Hey, uh, get to work, you tech men. Here's your corpus delecti, Doc. Now, Lieutenant McHugh, your sergeant downstairs has given me the general layout. It's open and shut on this guy Snyder, huh? As far as I'm concerned, there's his handkerchief. Bill, the head bartender here, identifies it, too. One hundred percent. Not many guys that carry a loud colored handkerchief like that. It's a cheap handkerchief, Logan, which means a lot of guys probably carry them. Casey, you must have all the pictures you need by this time. Go back to your paper with them and don't bother me. Ann and I have got to stick around for the payoff, pal. Well, sure. We're waiting for Snyder to be brought in. All right. Can you tell what caliber bullet killed the guy, Doc? I can, Captain. There's a thirty-eight caliber slug lying under this chair. I wouldn't touch it, of course, till you homicide guys got here. I see, Lieutenant. It's a thirty-eight, all right. The caliber you cops use. Yeah. Police positive size. Uh, Lieutenant Mack... Yes, Casey? Where did this guy Snyder carry this handkerchief you saw him use tonight? I, uh... You remember, Bill? Yeah, sure, in his coat, the breast pocket. I remember him tucking it back there. Huh? Why do you suppose he took it out of his breast pocket and dropped it here? As a definite lead? Well, I don't know. Maybe Paletti's last act was to yank that wiper out of Snyder's pocket. Uh, that's possible. Lieutenant, you were in the precinct house when the burglar alarm went off, huh? Uh, no, I was out getting some air uh, around the corner. Alone? Yes. Why? Just wondering. Uh, nobody ties Snyder up with his handkerchief except you and Bill, Lieutenant. Say, look here, Captain. You're not getting the wild idea that Until maybe... Until I have more than this handkerchief as evidence against Snyder, I'm going to investigate this job from every angle. But you can't possibly think that Captain I... Captain Logan. Yes, Feldman? We've got Snyder. Bring him up here. Yes, I get pictures of Okay, Snyder, get moving. Come on, you. Okay, okay, you don't have to yank my arm off. So, you're Snyder. I ain't trying to say any different. Hello, McHugh. You tried to get away with a little murder tonight, didn't you, Snyder? The smug who pinched me, give me the idea that's what you'll try to pin on me. Prove it if you can. Shut up until you're asked to talk. <laughs> okay, copper. You made the pinch, Feldman? Yes, Captain. He was sneaking out of an alley on Chester Street. He started to run, and I, I had to throw a shot over his head. Sneaking out of an alley, eh? Started to run. That don't prove I murdered anyone, McHugh. Shut up! Of course, you searched him, Feldman. Uh, first thing, sir, no gun on him and no sign of Joe Paletti's 20 grand. But I found these in his pocket. 30 caliber cartridges, huh? That's all we need, Captain. Eight. Naturally, he threw away the 38 revolver he used to kill Paletti. I never had any 38 revolver. I picked them cartridges up on the street. Sure, and I suppose you lost the nice colored handkerchief you had in the bar tonight. Uh, I, I don't know what you mean, McHugh. He didn't have any colored handkerchief when I pinched him, Lieutenant. Is this your handkerchief, Snyder? Well, I... No. No, I never saw that thing before. We know it's yours. What have you done with the money you took from Paletti? I didn't take no money. I didn't kill Paletti. The truth now will save you a lot of trouble, Snyder. Well, I... I... Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what you want to know. You killed Paletti. Yeah. Huh. That does it, Casey. Yeah, that does it. Now, Snyder, what did you do with the 20 grand you took? That's the big payoff question, ain't it, copper? Well, I wanted to pay me something so you don't get an answer until I see my lawyer. Take him to headquarters, boys. Come on, Snyder. Okay, copper. Gonna let him see a lawyer now, Logan? Why not? He's confessed the murder. And Casey, did you almost get me on a phony track about Lieutenant McHugh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was all wrong. One hundred percent. Well, see you later, pal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so long. Come on, Casey, let's get our stuff to the office. Okay, Annie. Annie, you know, it, it's funny. What? I've got the doggondest hunch that I wasn't all wrong. <laughs> The whole 
whole thing is blown up in my face, Casey. Snyder didn't kill Poletti. Now, calm down, Logan, and tell me about it. The lawyer Snyder insisted on seeing came in at noon today with seven reputable witnesses. Witnesses to what? To a perfect alibi. At the time Poletti was shot between 11.55 and midnight, Snyder was in a restaurant nearly a mile away. Seven reputable witnesses say that. Huh? They are ready to swear to it. Hmm. How does he explain his phony confession? Claims he had to stall us until he could prove his alibi. That's pretty thin. Sure. Eh? The truth is that he's a small-time cop hater who was getting a kick out of making us look like saps. Yeah, and he says he found those 38 shells and lost his handkerchief. Yeah. Casey, I figure he did lose that handkerchief. Just outside Paletti's tavern, maybe. Somebody found it, got an idea, and planted it besides Paletti's body. Any suspects? I... I don't like to say this, but... Well, cops sometimes go wrong, Casey. Lieutenant McHugh has been under heavy expense on account of his sick wife, and... Twenty grand is a lot of dough. Yeah. Snyder may have given his handkerchief to somebody, Logan. What do you mean? Well, if suspicions hadn't immediately centered on Snyder last night, everybody in the vicinity of Poletti's tavern would have been a suspect, huh? Yeah? Anybody who couldn't furnish an on-the-spot alibi might have been searched for the murder gun and that dough. Yeah. When Snyder was pinched and made his phony confession, he gave the killer plenty of time to get the stolen money under cover. Snyder and the killer were working together. That's my guess. I think it's the right one. I'll have another talk with that rat, Snyder. Uh, no, 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 pal, don't. Uh, let him go. Uh, let him go? Yeah, with the idea that he's gotten away with it. But tail him, Logan, day and night, until he leads you to his partner, the guy who has that 20 but... grand. Okay, Casey, we'll try it your way. But your way had better pay off. <laughs> Good night, Mrs. Wheelbracker. The strangest darn people come in here sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, don't look at us when you say that, pal. Casey! Hello, Miss Williams. Hello, Ethelbert. Say, I've been wondering when you two had come in. Anything new on that Paletti murder? No, not yet, Ethelbert. You know, I take a personal interest in that case, being as how it happened to a bartender, a brother professional, as you might say. <laughs> Captain Logan's detectives have been shadowing that Snyder guy for three days now. They sure have. They know what he's done every single yeah, minute. He hasn't made or received any phone calls or made contact with anyone who might be a logical suspect. Or at least he hadn't up to noon today when Logan showed us the latest report on him. It's nearly six o'clock. Maybe something's happened since. Uh-huh. Logan would have let me know if it had. Hmm. Maybe your idea about Snyder was wrong, Casey. Listen, that's what I'm hearing from Logan. Now, don't you start pulling it. The idea a little time, huh? Well, gee, I didn't mean... Oh, Walter, will you... Uh, never mind, Ethelbert, never mind. I'll get it. It's probably from me anyhow. Excuse me, Annie. Sure. Blue note. Uh, that you, Casey? Yeah. I thought it might be you, Logan. Anything new? Get into that jalopy of yours and come to Spring Road off 200th Street as soon as you can make it. Well, there's nothing but woods out there. Oh, yes, there is. There's something I want you to see, smart guy. What's that? The dead body of Snyder. There's all that's left of him, Casey, in that ditch. Uh, shot through the head. Yeah, twice with a thirty-eight revolver as Paletti was shot. Snyder had been dead over an hour when he was found here. Well, then that means that the detectives who were watching... He him... gave him the slip, Miss Williams. I wanted to keep this rat at headquarters and sweat the truth out of him, Casey. Instead, I listened to you. You see the result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mind giving us some of the details, Logan? I'd be happy to tell you all I know. You may have another bright idea. Don't rub it in, huh? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is my fault, not yours. Huh? Say, Logan. I, I hope you'll have an idea to give me a, a different idea than I have. Hey, pal, are you sick? I, here's what happened. 
At three o'clock this afternoon, Snyder was walking up Crosley Street with one of my guys behind him when he suddenly hopped into a Ford sedan, parked at the curb, and got away. Huh? Another guy was at the wheel all ready, for, all ready to go. I think the driver of that sedan was Snyder's partner in the Paletti murder. I'm still riding with your theory about that. And he killed Snyder because... He didn't want to share that 20 grand with him. He needed... He wanted it all. Or because he knew Snyder was being trailed. Snyder was dangerous to him. Yeah, that fits too. Obviously, he and Snyder met by appointment, Logan. Snyder expected him to be waiting in a car at that time and in that place. Sure. Well, then your killer is someone Snyder talked to since you turned him loose. Yep. You checked on... Everyone Snyder talked to? Yeah. There hasn't been a logical suspect in the bunch, Casey, until... until today. You mean he talked to somebody today? Yeah. Several hours before he got into that sedan. Who? Lieutenant McHugh. McHugh? Captain Logan. From the first, I figured McHugh might have killed Paletti, but... I've never, never really believed he did. You believe it now? He needed that dough, Casey, all of it, for a sick wife. He's a cop. Well, Eddie would have opened that upstairs door for him. I've known Mac a long time. He's been a good guy and a good cop. Logan, where did he and Snyder talk today? Outside of Paletti's tavern. Paletti's tavern? Yeah. Snyder had the nerve to go in there and ask for a drink. That's all he had a chance to do. One of the bartenders grabbed him and threw him out of the joint. Lieutenant McHugh came along just then and helped him out of the gutter. Then they talked. Yeah, for two or three minutes, walking up the street together. Then McHugh went off duty soon afterwards, and he didn't go home. He could have met Snyder in that sedan. It looks like McHugh all the way, Casey. How close was your detective when Snyder was given the bum's rush from Poletti? Oh, he'd only just followed him inside the joint. It happened that fast. Which bartender gave Snyder that rush act? Uh, it was Andy. Uh, oh, Andy. Who was in the bar downstairs when Poletti was killed upstairs. He couldn't have been Snyder's partner. Oh. Your man's sure it was Andy, huh? Well, he didn't have time to ask for names, but the description he gave me is Andy. He's tall with dark hair. Well, Bill is tall, but he's bald. Well, Gus has dark hair. Oh, but he isn't tall. Say, your guy got only a quick look at that bartender. Yeah, but he couldn't be wrong about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Logan. A medium-sized guy looks tall when you see him beside a very short guy. Now, Snyder was a shrimp, and Gus hauling him around with a collar would look like a six-footer. But, Gus! Poletti would have unlocked that upstairs door for Gus, Logan. He was a trusted employee. Gus didn't report for work until after Poletti was killed. Casey, you're right. Let's get Gus and go to work on him. He's a tough cookie, Logan. You'll never break him. I'll make him talk. I don't think you will. Uh, look, Logan, can I stick my neck out again? Casey, I'll listen to anything now. All right. We'll take Gus for a little ride. A ride? Yeah. But not in a police car this time. We'll use my jalopy. <laughs> Where are you guys driving me to? You said you were taking me to headquarters. Hey, we're way out in the country. We changed our minds about headquarters, Gus. What do you mean? Too many people hang around down there. Where are you taking me? Just take it easy, sucker. Look, you're a cop, Captain Logan. You... You can't kid me into thinking that... We you... know you got that 20 grand, Gus. I tell you, I don't know anything about yeah, it. Yeah, that's what you told it's us. That's what I'll go on telling you. This is a nice deserted spot, Logan. Yeah, a perfect spot, Casey. Shall I stop here? Yeah. Right. Yeah, what... what... What are you going to do here? Just talk. For a while. Step out of the car, Gus. No, you... Step out. Hey, what... Why are you pulling that gun? You can't bluff me. I ain't afraid. What have you done with the money you stole from Paletti? I told you. What have you done with that dough? I ain't got it. I ain't got it. We want that 20 grand, Gus. And we're going to have it. Hey. I'm getting a picture now. 
You two came to my hotel room alone. You bring me out here alone. I get it now. You two are working together. Logan and I do a lot of work together, Gus. So that's it. You want that dough for yourselves. Where is it? I ain't talking. We'll see about that. Here, Casey, hold my gun on this mug. Sure, I... Cal, I will. Oh, you don't. You drop the gun. I'll get it. No, I got it. Casey, he has to come. You can't, you lousy. I stick him up. Okay. Okay. Ah, thanks for this, Gat. <laughs> you two saps should have stayed honest. You ain't got the brains for fast stuff. So you thought you'd hijack my 20 grand. Listen, Gus, you're in the racket. You know how guys have to figure... If you'd been nice and told us where to find that dough, sure, Gus, we'd have been nice. So now I'll be nice to you. <laughs> Tell you where to find it. <laughs> it's buried under a flower bed on my old man's grave in Oakwood Cemetery. I buried the gat I used to kill Paletti and Snyder there, too. That was smart. <laughs> yeah, I think of little things like that. Just like you, Muggs, thought of bringing me to this deserted spot. In a car that I'll drive away. Alone. Uh, Gus, you, you're not going to... No, Gus, you, you can't... You get up between the eyes like Snyder and Pauletti. No! What the... Something the matter, Gus? This, this gun is empty. Uh-huh. That's another little thing we thought of. Oh, you, you double-crossed me. Thanks for the confession, Gus. Come on. Now we're really going to headquarters. All right. And then, Casey, you and I have got something to do with the Blue Note. Ah, what's that, Logan? I'll tell you on the way about it. The present low cost of glass containers and the fact that they can be used so economically to protect the flavor of food products of all kinds is due in no small measure to the pioneering work of the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation. The advantages of glass are many and obvious. Glass lets you see what you buy before you buy it. Glass containers are easy and safe to open. Glass won't affect flavor or aroma. Anchor glass containers and tamper-proof anchor caps so widely used by the food packing industry are products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. So you cops found that 20 grand and the murder gun just where Gus said it was. Hey, eh, Captain Logan? That's right, Ethelbert. Yeah. Gus figured he had no reason to lie to a pair of dead pigeons, as he figured Logan and me to be. Well, I'm certainly glad that a disgrace to the bartending profession like he was is going to get what he deserves. Hey, uh, by the way, Captain, what brings you here to the Blue Note tonight? Uh, Ethelbert... Uh... Casey and I want a box of the best cigars you have in the place. Yeah, we uh, we want you to send them to Lieutenant McHugh, Ethelbert. He, here's his address here. Well, sure, but Casey, why are you and Captain Logan, head of the homicide department, sending cigars to a cop? Well, you, you see, well, that is... Uh, uh, it's just... <clears throat> you see, McHugh likes to smoke cigars. <laughs> Crime Photographer is directed by John Dietz and stars Stotts Cotsworth as Casey. It is written by Alonzo Dean Cole and is based on the fictional character of Casey created by George Harmon Cox. It's lighter, more compact. It requires no deposit, no return to the store. We're talking about the famous Anchor Glass beer and ale bottle pioneered by Anchor Hawking shortly before the war. It will soon be released for civilian use, so watch for it. The new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle. A product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Our cast features Miss Leslie Woods as Anne, John Gibson as Ethelbert, Bernard Lenro as Logan, and the Blue Note pianist is Herman Chittison. The original music is by Archie Blyer. 
Crime Photographer is brought to you each Thursday at this time by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees. Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. Tony Larman speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, this was just a really solid, uh, well-constructed mystery. A lot of twists and clues that uh, came along in the course of the episode. I do think that Captain Logan blaming Casey uh, uh, was wrong and he recognized it. Because even if Casey is wrong, he is not the uh, police. If Casey has an idea and you act on it, uh, and you're the captain, you're the one who's responsible for the result because his idea sounded good to you as the uh, professional. A Blue Note Bulletin has a couple of notes uh, where uh, it's important to pay attention to details. Uh, one thing that they mention is that the lieutenant mentioned liking cigars, which uh, was the reason why... Uh, Logan sent cigars uh, to him at the end. I thought it was a slightly abrupt ending. I do get that. Uh, one other thing that uh, Dr. Webb does call out over at uh, Blue Note Bulletin is just the uh, size of the uh, robbery uh, uh, loot. You'd think $20,000 is not a big uh, amount of money, but August 1946, $20,000 is more than $254,000 in today's monies. That must have been some factory to have a weekly payroll that big. By my back-of-the-envelope calculations from the census data, the annual sales of goods from that factory would have been about $31 million with uh, 400 employees. And that's only if the bar cashed every uh, single check of every single worker. It is very odd to have that much money in a safe in a retail establishment nowadays, no matter the reason. Obviously, Cole wanted an amount worth committing murder for. But this is outlandishly high, and Cole uh, may have wanted a near gasp from the listener. Good point, and if you did not gasp when you heard the figure recently, you now have time and an opportunity for a makeup gasp. So, there you go, there's that opportunity. All right, listener comments and feedback, and uh, had a couple of comments here from Bill uh, regarding uh, some of our, uh, and these come from Facebook, some of our uh, Encore uh, presentations. Uh, Bill writes, hi Adam, I hope you had a great vacation. I've enjoyed the throwback episodes, but I've had one slight issue. At the end of your new recorded intro to these episodes, you added the sound of a Star Trek uh, transporter, I guess, as a way to take us back in time. Since it is a time machine, you should have used the sound of the TARDIS. Thanks. Uh, of course, the TARDIS from Doctor Who. Uh, now, to be honest, uh, Andrew Rines actually does the editing, so he added in the sound effect. And while that is the sound effect that is used for a transporter on uh, Star Trek, uh, I, I think that he's using it more as just kind of a fade uh, to the past and you know, a handy uh, transition. I, I had some really strong affection for the idea of using a TARDIS sound effect, but I'm not sure all the issues that would be uh, involved in that. Plus, I think there there is a question of familiarity. I'm very familiar with Doctor Who, but I don't know what percentage of the audience is. And if the sound of a TARDIS materializing isn't something you're familiar with, it may be a bit disconcerting. I suspect I might get a few what it was that strange sound. But thanks for the suggestion. And uh, then I uh, have a question here 
uh, regarding the Rogues Gallery episode. And on that one, Bill writes, this is the first time I've heard this episode. The voice of Rogue's conscience on Cloud 8 sounds like Susie from Box 13. Do you know if this was uh, Sylvia uh, Pickard? Uh, thanks so much, Bill. No, it was not Sylvia Pickard. Uh, the voice, actually, it's a bit high-pitched, uh, kind of intentionally, uh, as part of this whole Cloud 8 situation. Uh, but that was actually voiced by Peter Leeds, who was a veteran a character actor. And I do want to say, if, uh, you know, because we were playing programs we haven't played in years and years, that uh, if, uh, if uh, you enjoyed any of the series we played, you can go to biglist.greatdetectives.net and uh, you can take a lesson to the full uh, series and uh, check out more episodes. But I appreciate uh, your uh, questions, uh, Bill. And I want to go ahead and also thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Jonathan. Jonathan's been one of our Patreon supporters since March, currently supporting us at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Jonathan. And that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for The Fat Man, and we'll be back next Monday with another episode of Crime Photographer. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.